혹시 잘 들리나요? 안 들리나요? 예, 예, 감사합니다. 지금 바깥에서 뭐 청소하고 있어서 그좀 노이즈가 있는데 시간이 지나면 아마 없어지지 않을까 생각을 해요. 한 1분 정도만 기다렸다 시작을 할게요. 아 그리고 그 학생들 이제 중간에 피드백을 중간에 보면 이제 코스가 되게 어렵다 뭐 그렇게 얘기하는데 그한 그 가지 제가 얘기하려고 하는 건그 혹시 수업을 듣다가 그 학생들이 뭐 질문을 할때그 한글로 질문해도 전혀 상관이 없으니까 그렇게 질문을 해도 되고 또 하다가 잘 이해가 안 가면 설명을 다시 해달라고 해도 상관은 없어요 그러니까 지금 하신 부분 다시 설명해 주세요 뭐 그렇게 써도 상관은 없으니까요 잘 이해가 안 되면 그렇게 얘기해 주시면 좋을 것 같아요. 그러면 시작을 하도록 하겠습니다. 오케이, okay, so let's start today. And what we're going to cover today is a category theory. And, and this is actually, I, I prepared my lectures based on chapter 8 of Bob Tennant's book. activate checkbox yeah so chapter 8 of tenant's book and then but you, actually you don't really need to look at tenant's book i mean from my perspective if you just read the lecture note that is available in the course web page which is in a github and you should be able to understand most of the things that I'm, I'm going to explain here. So and then let me start with some motivation. And you might wonder why we have to think about what we have to learn. Something called the category theory, which you normally hear about it from mathematics course. But it's actually one a branch of mathematics. And there are a few reasons about why one should care about, uh, actually, let me just give an overview of our category theory. Category theory is invented by mathematicians when they realize in different branches of mathematics, there are some commonalities. So there's some construction in group theory, also there's some construction in analysis, and it happens that these constructions look similar. And then category theory actually tells you some commonality is really going on. They are trying to do the same thing. I mean, the same kind of asking same kind of questions, answering in the same style. It's just that the context is a bit different. So category theory help you to identify uh, concepts that appears, the common concepts and common techniques that appears in different branches of mathematics. Also, it plays uh, many roles in the foundation of mathematics. And also, I mean, yeah, the, the, some other peoples in math, they try to use category theory to transfer some techniques from one area to a very different area. And, uh, but for us, for computer scientists, especially the one who studied the programming languages, 
category theory has the big impact in PL. So it's effect of category theory in PL. And there are, so one impact that you can see is that there are programming languages which and some concepts in those programming languages are derived from category theory. So those programming languages, you can see it. I mean, some programming languages you may have heard about is Scala. Also some programming language like Rust and Haskell. And in these languages, you will hear something like Monads. And in Haskell, there's some type class called functor. And in Scala, there is also there's some, something called functor. And also in, maybe also in Java, there is something called the generics in those languages and so on. And some of them, like monad and functor, they are directly coming from category theory. Generics is highly influenced by what people learn by looking at programming language concepts from categorical perspective. So it's a, the one impact is a language design. And another big impact of category the theory in programming languages is the research on semantics. So many concepts that you, you will encounter in, in the research on semantics is gonna be derived from category theory. And, but something that we care a lot more in this course is that the category theory actually help us to, I mean, form a nice space in domain theory. So in, so it allows show, well, constructs. complex domains. So domains are, I mean, if you remember what we studied about semantics of programming languages, the starting point of doing semantics is to define domains, appropriate domains. And then in some sense, the rest of the semantics follows from the well-chosen definition of domains. But sometimes defining domain can be quite hard so one example is actually what you saw before. We look at the domain omega when we talk about input, output, and abort or failure. And that omega was, was not defined explicitly. Instead, it's defined by the some domain which sets by the following isomorphism. It's isomor isomorphic. To sigma hat plus z cross omega and c arrow omega extended with bottom, okay? And uh, sigma was a set of states, which is a variable to values. And sigma hat was essentially two copies of sigma. The first copy is for the normal termination. And then second copy is for abnormal termination, which is caused by fail command. And then this, this case was a output. I mean, this case was for the input and then we had a bottom here for the term non-termination here. Okay, so that we, we when we learn about when you use this omega, we assume that omega exists 
can also satisfy what I call initiality property that allows us to define functions on omega. But we never actually showed or proved such an omega actually exists. So we, we look at omega, omega appears left-hand side as well as on the right-hand side. It's a bit like omega is a fixed point of some operator that works on not uh, elements, but on the, on the domain. So if we are the right-hand side that you see here, we apply that operator. And then we are saying the omega is a fixed point uh, on apply to for fixed point of that operator. So that the question arises whether such a fixed point I mean, even exists. And then it becomes much more complex if we, because we're gonna use some more complicated domain later. And that domain will look like this. So there is a domain D, which is isomorphic to its own function space. So it's a continuous function from D to D and plus some more things like set of integers and so on. So we will think about a domain which is isomorphic to the function space. If you heard about uh, set theory or maybe from general uh, public science or public math, you heard that if you I mean, unless a set is a singleton set, the set contains only one element, if that's not the case, then for any set, X, I mean, it cannot be isomorphic to I mean, X function space, X, I mean, union something extra. Erase C. Right. For set, this will never happen. I mean, if you take a if set X contains more than one element, I mean, the, this function space is always larger than the, the set X, X itself. And so it will never be isomorphic. However, for domains, we are not taking any functions, we are taking only continuous functions. So there is some chance that they, there is a domain D which satisfies this isomorphism. And it turns out there actually exists and category theory allows us to show the existence of such, uh, such domain D. So domain D, which in a sense include all the continuous functions from D to itself. Okay. And coming up with this D was actually one of the big achievements in semantics research. And it's done by Dana Scott, who got, I mean, who is really godfather of domain theory, also who got Turing Award and many other prizes. Okay, so we, we study category theory because it influenced the language design, as well as it has a huge influence in the semantics. In particular, we, want to learn about some techniques from category theory that let us handle I mean, this question. So that allows us to show the existence of complicated domain, which is defined essentially recursively. Okay, so that's the motivation. Then, so let's start with the categories, the so definition of category. So before giving actually a definition, let me just give you an example of a category. I mean, category is a defined very abstract way. So what which means that the, the definition of a category can be understood in a multiple different ways, okay? And let me just mention a few words. So, okay, let me give you for first some abs uh, high level informal description about categories. So category, consists of a few participants, a few main actors, which appears in the definition of category. And then two main actors are objects. I mean, two kind, there are two kinds of actors in the category one. Uh, yeah, it, the one kind is 
uh, is object. The other kind is morphisms. And then, so these are the main participants of, of, the, of any category. So one, and some, there are some intuitions about how, what this object represents and morphism represents. One typical intuition is that objects represent space. Morphisms represent uh, good functions between spaces, or maybe the be better way is a structure preserving functions between spaces. And then category, the, the abstract definitions say there, are, there exists a set of objects. There is also a set of morphisms and they have to satisfy certain properties. But it's the concrete, the intuitions behind these objects is that objects are like spaces, morphisms are like stru structure preserving functions between spaces. And there are another intuition is that for, from more programming language side, objects are like types. So there will be many objects in a category there are, which means that category, you can form a category where objects are types and morphisms are programs. I mean, or maybe better way to say is, so functions in a programming language. Then often these functions have take an input and uh, return an output. The type is these functions will become a morphism from its, the, the type of its input to the type of its output. So in another uh, intuitions behind the cat more programming language like intuition is that objects are going to be types and morphisms are like uh, well-typed functions in a programming language, which means that it's, it will have a Specific, specified types for the input, specified types for the output. And let me just give you an example and then give a definition. One example of a category is that objects are sets, okay? And then morphisms are functions. So typical sets are written like X and Y and so on. And functions in our category, we specify function, we clarify its domain and its codomain. The functions will be written like x to y, mean g, y to z, and so on. And that means we have a function f and function g. Function f goes from set x to set y. Function g goes from set y to set z. Okay. And category talk about we have a collection of sets means these kind of sets there. And we have a collection of morphisms, which are functions here, and then they have to satisfy certain properties. So that's what's gonna be specified by a category. And on, if we give you one more example, another example is going to be groups. I mean, if you are not, maybe nowadays machine learning is very popular. So maybe everybody knows there is some vector space. So it's a real valued vector space and the well, vector space over real. So we have a vector space uh, such as R to the N and some different vector space and so on, maybe X and Y. And then the corresponding morphisms in this case is going to be linear maps. Because for vector space, the operations we have, are, I mean, the, the operations we have are additions and constant multiplication. So structure preserving maps are those which preserve this addition and constant multiplication. So linear maps is going to be a appropriate morphism in the setting. Okay, so 
Okay, I mean, these are all vague, but let me just give you a definition here. So category is a tuple. which consists of something called objects. I mean, this OBJ, which is going to be a collection of what I call objects there. And then also there is something called home, which is going to be a collection of morphisms. And then we have a two operator on morph, one operator uh, for, for composing morphisms. And the other is called ID, which is a specific kind of morphism. So the category is a topo. So it has a full component such that first OBJ is a collection. You can say it's, you can, it's just set a collection whose elements Uh, called objects. And then second, for all object X and Y, home of X and Y is another collection. And then whose elements are called morphisms from X to Y. So these are the morphisms from X to Y. So what does that mean? This means that for every pair of object X and Y, we are specifying morphisms that goes from X to Y. Okay. So it's a very, in the, using the programming language terminology, it's a typed specification about what kind of morphisms we have here. So these are the two components. And then the third, this circle is for the composing morphisms. So in order to compose a morphism that have to type check. So it, it say that for every object X, Y, Z, we have a functions in mean, this circle X, Y, Z. That's a composition functions, which take morphism, which take a two morphism and return another morphism. And then what's going to be a type in order to compose it well, the two input morphism has to type check, has to match, which means that it, the first more, the, the, the second component goes from X to Y. And the first component goes from Y to Z. So it is a target of the first and the source of the, I mean, source of the first target of the second should match. I mean, that's how you normally write function composition. And then if we are given something like this, then we, we can produce a morphism that goes from X to Z, okay? So X is a source for entire thing. G is the target for, for the entire thing, okay? So that's the, I mean, this object is a function that goes from the, the what I wrote here. And then the first component First component is for X in OBJ or for objects there exists identity morphism that goes from X to X. Okay. 
So what does this all to purple really means? So we have an identity here. So this tuple means we have a bunch of objects, we have a bunch of well, bunch of morphisms which are in home. And then they, we also know for each of morphism there are types. So what's gonna be the source, what, what object is going to be the source, what object is going, going to be the type and target. So that's why we have this home x comma y. And then this is circle means we have an operator that allows us to compose two morphisms. ID means that we have for every object, we have an identity morphism. And then this whole thing has to satisfy some property. And then the above data. Satisfy associativity. And identity. I mean, let's say associativity and identity conditions. So what those two conditions are for in so these two conditions are conditions about operator I mean is a composition operator and an identity I mean the identity morphism really the intuitive everybody say is that this com composition should be associative and identity should be if you act like an identity with respect to composition so the, I think the okay, let me just write this for what this tell us is for every morphism that goes from X to Y for every objects for every objects so this, and every morphism X to Y. So we have we say that if we compose F with identity on X, and that has to be a morphism that goes from X to Y, and that's same as F, and that's also same as you compose F with identity on each target. So this is the identity condition. And the associativity condition said for x, y, u, v, objects. Now, if you have a morphism map, I will write this note. I mean, this one, although it's a formally correct, it's a not very easy to see what's really going on. So I will write this as a f, x, arrow, y, to mean that morphism, we have a morphism f that goes, who's, that goes from the object x to object y. I mean, it's for saying exactly the one that I just wrote above. They are the same thing. So if we have a F that goes from X to Y, G that goes from Y to U, H that goes from U to V, then we can apply composition operator in a multiple different way. We first compose F with a G and that give a morphism that goes from X to U and then compose it with H. That has to be same as H composed with G and composed with F. So that's associativity property. Although I didn't quite explain it here, I mean, instead of writing the subscript, I often omit subscript and just write the circle and for identity, sometimes I also omit this X, just write an ID. Okay. So, so there was the setting. The setting is if we have a set of objects, set of morphisms together with their source and target types given by objects. And we have a composition operator for morphisms and compatible morphisms. And also we have identity morphisms and they have to satisfy identity conditions and then associativity condition. 
So if you think about this, this is very minimal kind of a condition. Uh, I mean, we don't really say very much. We just have a set of objects and morphism and there is an op the only operator we have a compositions and an identity operator. But it turns out having just this, it still allows us to say many things about I mean, the mathematical languages. Okay. So I mean, the examples of this definition. Let me just move this. Ah, so the OBJ, I think I, I meant this cap, OBJ means capital. <laughs> I think the this O is a capital letter. So my writing is not very good. So I, I really meant not this. If you make it confused, this is all easy. That's what I really meant. But okay. ah, that's right. O B C the X Y. Some people typically write as a capital X and capital Y. So, but I wrote this a uh, small X and small Y. You're right. This is a bit confusing. People typically write using capital X and capital Y. But in the lecture notes, and then the, yeah, I, I use a small x and small y. But Yonu is right. I mean, that's the typical, that's a common convention. Okay, any other questions? Okay, so let me give you an example. So first example is what I just told you before. The one example is a cat category of set. So in this case, I'm going to use right like this. So here we I mean to specify this cat category of set, we have to specify the, these four components, so OBJ and then home, the, the composition and ID. And how can we do this? The OBJ, is a collection of all sets. So if you are really care about foundation of math, I mean, one have to be a big, you have to actually make some choice or so-called small sets. But if you are not, don't really care about this process paradox or something like this, to say, oh, it's a collection of all sets. So typically this collection, if it's not a small set, it, it can be I mean, more than set, but for now, just don't worry about this. It's just a collection of all sets, okay? And then for home of x, y, it is a, I mean, in this case, you can say it's just set, but it's just a collection of all functions from x to y. And then the circle is function composition. So, and then id is an id on x, it's an identity function. On x, on us, on the set x. So, so as you can see, I mean, the you already know that function composition, in the standard sense, satisfy associativity, and if you compose any function with the identity function, it's just the function that you started with. So they satisfy these identity axioms and uh, associativity axioms that. I talk about here. And so that's a one very well, I mean, the examples, the representative example of a category. But there's another example that you we already covered. The other example, the another example is freedom. 
So it's, a, it's the category of free domain. So in this case, up, what, what are the objects? Objects are free domains, which are partially ordered set where every chain has list upper bound. And then more, what are the morphisms? Morphisms are continuous functions here. And then circle is function composition. And then ID is an identity function. So if you look at these two examples, you can kind of see that, I mean, that a very common way of form a category is to take the kind of spaces that you care about, that space can be any sets, or that space can be any pre-domains, you will just collect all of them and form this capital OBJ. And then you collect all the structure preserving map. In the, in the first case, just, it can be, it's, it's just any function. Second case, they are continuous functions. You just collect all of them and they form uh, they, these morph, they, they morphisms. And then the circle become function composition, ID becomes identity function. And that's a one very typical way of forming category. That's not the only way, but that's a very typical way of forming a category. Giving one more example is here that we have a category of a domain. Actually, you can form a two category of a domain, one category so domains. It's the same as here, except that the object part is changed to domains. Then the others are all same. So and then that's a, another category. And actually, there's one more category and based on what we learn. Sometimes people write it dom dots, which is the category of domains. with strict continuous function. So object here just consists of domains. But for morphisms, we use uh, strict continuous functions. So instead of just continuous function, we add this additional condition called the strictness. So we are in these two cat, and then the rest is the same. So if you compare these two, we are taking two, di two different concepts, one in one case, like a dom, dom bottom, right, or a dom dot. We are the, what we mean by structure preserving map in this set setup means struct, strict continuous function. It should preserve bottom as well as behave well with the limits the list of per bound of chains, but in the case of a DOM, the, what we, the, the structure preserving map is just continuous functions. So it doesn't really need to care, it doesn't need to preserve the, the bottom element there. So we can make a choice, and if you make a different choice, this category, which some people call it, it's a kind of some universe over which you are doing mathematics, or defining semantics, and this universe have a different properties. Okay, and these properties start to matter a lot when you think about this uh, with the solution of uh, that uh, this complicated defined domains. Okay, I hope that by looking at these two, you get some idea that a category looks like formalization or generalization of notion of spaces, and then good maps between those spaces. Okay, but. Category doesn't always have to be of this form. So that's a one very good intuition that I want to keep. But category is not always of this form. So here's a very strange category that also is quite useful to gain some understanding. Because the definition of a category is so abstract, I mean, you can 
instantiate category in a multiple different, very different kinds of, we can have very different kinds of instantiation. So this third is a very strange instantiation, which is still very useful and also help you to understand some construction there. It is that suppose we are given a partially ordered set. Okay, so we have a set P together with order relation less than. And this is a partially ordered, so which means that this less than equal, I mean, this order relation is reflexive, transitive, and anti-symmetric. Okay. Now, in this case, we can form a category from, we can view this partially ordered set as a category. So how do we do it? So in this case, objects correspond to elements of P. Okay. And then now we have to specify morphisms, which is what's going to be home. To specify this morphism between, well, go from X to Y. X and Y are object uh, elements in P. This, there, are, we, there are two cases here. If x is smaller than or equal to y, we just said this is a singleton set star. Otherwise, it's an empty set. Okay. I mean, the definition of category doesn't really tell us, I mean, it doesn't force us to use functions of any kind. For to talk about morphisms, we can just say, specify any collection and said that they are the morphisms and something like this is going on home x comma y it can be empty set that's completely fine if x is not equal to y and x comma y is e equal to the singleton set I mean f x is smaller than equal to y okay. then now we have what's going to be the identity identity should be an element in home x comma x this is so id x is equal to star okay because the order relation is reflexive why this is possible and because order this is reflexive so x is less than equal to x Therefore, home of x comma x is a singleton set. So that's why we can put it like this. And what's the function comp composition operator? The composition operator here that takes home yz and then home xy and return um, X Z. It's defined like this. Okay, we if home Y Z. Okay, let me write this. If Y is smaller than or equal to Z, and x is smaller than or equal to y. In that case, we do we define this circle doing the case analysis if that's the one case. And another case is you know, y is not smaller than or equal to z or x is not smaller than or equal to y. So in the above case, because of the transitivity, we know, what we know is that the I mean, x should be less than or equal to z, which means that uh, this target set should, should be a singleton set star. So this uh, circle will become, and above, a constant function. 
that take two singleton elements. I mean, but in that in the first case, the home of x comma z is a singleton set. Home of the x comma y is going to be a singleton set. So the in this it's a constant function. What it does is that it take two stars and just return star. So that's what it does. And in the bottom case, I think. So in the bottom case, maybe just write it like this here. It's not this is the and so if one of them fails, so in the bottom case, what we have is that this home either this home is empty or the second argument is empty. What does this mean? This means that the domain of this circle is going to be empty. So home of yz cross home of x, y is going to be empty. So if the domain is empty, we can, we can set this circle as the so-called empty function. So what does empty function mean? I mean, function can be understood as a specific particular kind of relation. So if you think about the graph of this function, which means if you just collect all the input output pairs of this function circle, so then let's form a graph with the, it's, it's a relation. And then in this case, it's going to be, I mean, just, just an empty set. Okay. So, I mean, this part, some of you may be not familiar with, if we have a function K that goes from set X to set Y, but set X is empty, empty set, so then you may say, okay, how can we define a function? But actually you can define a function by saying K is the empty function. It doesn't do anything. I mean, so it just doesn't do anything. I mean, if you view this input output pairs of F, that that's going to be the empty set. And that, that is an empty function. And then this the below is defined in terms of the empty function. So the point I'm making is that any partially ordered set is going to be induced a category. And that this was, category is very different. Object in this category is not a space, it's an element of P. And then this old partial order is, I mean, the morphism is really encoding of this partial order. So let me tell you some example of this. Okay, so for yeah, so one, one example is if you have take a natural number, I mean, concrete, together with a, just a usual relation less than, then the category we are constructing have an object, which is natural numbers, like, I mean, computer science natural numbers start with a zero, so zero, one, two, three, four, and so on. So these are, So it's a category constructed by from here and number 20. So all these numbers form an object here. And then the morphisms is, I mean, there is only one morphism from any number to itself, any morphism that from number to itself like this. And then also morphism if some number is smaller than equal to equal to other number. So if zero is smaller than equal to one, there's a morph one morphism there, another morphism here, yet another morphism here, morphism here and morphism here and so on. And then the similar way one is there's morphism like this, like this. So there are many morphisms that represent the order relationship. So what does this really mean is that category can be understood as a generalization of a partial order. 
So here it's exactly the partial order becomes a category. And in the more general case, category can be understood as a, I mean, a generalization of partial order. So some concept that we define for partial order like monotone functions, it will have an analog for category. So so-called functor that we'll look at maybe today or the, the next Monday is related to uh, monotone functions on this partially ordered set. Okay, then uh, in the notes, I define the, the various object in a category like uh, initial, initial object, terminal object, products and uh, co-products. But, and then I explain the, the idea of a functor, but let me just explain the functor first and then if Uh, yeah. Okay. Let's not let's follow the the order that I originally planned. Okay. So what I'm gonna do next is the, so these are the examples. So exam, example shows the category is a formalization of spaces and morphisms, but also category can be understood as generalization of partially ordered set. Okay. okay so. Now, in the category, by using, I mean, the, 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 these, I mean, category assumes very little. We only say that we only have morphisms and objects. But still, I mean, these morphisms and objects are very powerful. So we can identify many interesting properties just in terms of objects and morphisms. So there are, I don't know what I call them. Uh, actually, before going there, let me just mention this. This is really important. Some very important, there is a very important notation. And they, the, a few notation which is really important in the category theory. The first is something that you already saw. We're going to write it something like this. Or sometimes we write it like this to mean that F is a morphism that goes from X to Y. Okay, so that's a one important notation. And actually, more important notation is so-called commutative diagram. So what this commutative diagram tells us is it's a commutativity of, uh, of certain expressions that you can construct expression on morphisms that you can construct by using operators in a category. So the commutative diagram has this form X. U, V, G. So just like I said here, the, this f, I mean x go to y with f on top, that means we have a morphism f that goes from x to y. So we have uh, four morphisms here. f goes from x to y, g goes from y to v, h goes from x to u, k goes from u to v. Okay, But when we write this type of circle, what we mean is that we are talking about four morphisms of appropriate source and target objects. At the same time, we are saying we have in composing G and F and composing K and H using this composition operator for morphism. They produce the same thing. And the commutative diagram doesn't have to this have this form of a box. It can be any diagram. And this commutativity means that for any two paths from the same source to the target, if you compose all the morphisms along the path using composition operator, they will lead to the same thing. So another example is going to be look like this. 
F, F, and G, and K. And you see that from X to V, we have a two paths. One is going for, like, I mean, this way. Another is going way below. And then this, when you write a diagram like this, we are claiming these two paths, if you compose all the morphisms in each path, they lead to the same thing, which means that G circle F is the same as K. So many proofs in the category theory is boils down to diagram chasing. So you state some of known fact like this uh, commutativity a little bit, and then by and, and then just form a diagram. And once you form a diagram, you can from the known commutativity, you can deduce more, much more complicated commutativity. Okay. So now using this commutative diagram, we're gonna define some interesting properties of an object. So here we're going to define something called terminal objects. And initial objects. And products. Of two objects. Also co-products of two objects. So, I mean, all these things that I mentioned, you can view them as a name. You can view it two, two ways. They are the names, well, you can say well-known names. Given to objects in a category. Let's satisfy some interesting properties. And then they are also closely related to some constructions. They can be carried out in a category. So these things, you view it two ways. One is they are properties of some objects. That's a number one view. Also, they are, I mean, most of the time when we talk about these initial objects, terminal objects, and so on, the products, co-products in a category, we are also referring to there is also a way to construct such a good objects out of existing ones. And so it's, it's related to construction as well as the properties. So nice properties as well as construction there. So what are they? And so let me start with something very really simple. So given a category C, so I'm gonna say it's a category. And then let's say X is an object of the category. So I will write it like this to means that maybe yeah, this is a bit easier to read to mean that objects of a category C. So X is an object of a category C. So then we say X is an initial object. If for every morphism, no, for every objects in the category C, There exists a unique morphism from X to Y. So in other words, this H home of X to Y 
you, it's going to be a single term. If you compute this cardinality, that's going to be equal to 1. So that's property of an initial object. Then let me show, tell you about this final object. So we say, so that's a definition. There's another definition. So we say x is a final object. If all object C, there exists a unique morphism from y to c, y to x. Okay. In other words, cardinality of home from y to x is going to be a single term. Okay. So that's called a final object. Now, if you I mean, say, so I mean, just let me tell you a bit of the some patterns that appears here. If you compare the notion of initial object and notion of final object, the definition looks pretty similar, except that in one case, we go from X to Y. In the other case, we go from Y to X. So if you may well that you take the definition of initial objects and you flipped the direction of this unique morphism that's required, required in the definition of initial object, you get a definition for final object. So this relationship is called dual relationship, and this initial and final are dual concepts there. Okay, so I think the best way to understand this way, this initial object and final object is actually compute what they are. So let's say, so here's an exercise I want you to do. So for in the category of set and computes what initial and final objects are. And then also the second exercise is suppose we have a partially ordered set. And then also do the same thing, find out so initial final object in the partially ordered set may or might or might not exist, but suppose it exists, then what is it going to be? So that's the, the second question. So I will give you three minutes to think about this.
Okay, so tell you what they are. So the, for initial objects in the category, that's going is an empty set. Okay. I said there is a, if the, the functions that goes from empty set to some other set, there is only one function, which is the empty function. So that's why they say the empty set is the initial objects in the category of set because The empty function is the only function in this case. And then for final objects, in this case, it's a singleton set. So it doesn't matter what it contains, which means that there are many final objects which are all, in a sense, isomorphic because they are all contains the same elements. Okay. So then, then this final, there's only one final object and the final object is a singleton set that consists, contains only one element. That's because for any set X, the function that goes from set X to the singleton, singleton set star, I mean, the only function is a constant function that returns the star every, for all the inputs in X. So, so that, that's why there is only the final objects of this form. And for this category constructed from partial order, the initial objects correspond to the list element in the partial order. Why that's the case? The, if you look at this definition of initial object in the partial order, that means that for object Y, for every element in the partial order, there exists a unique morphism. I mean, the partial order case, the uniqueness, there's only one, at most one morphism. So there is a morphism that goes from X to Y, which means that X should be less than or equal to Y in order for a morphism to exist in a category generated by the partial order. So x should be less than or equal to y for every y in the in, in, in p, which means that x is the list element. And, and definition exactly corresponds to that list element. For final, correspond to the greatest or large greatest element. And if you look at the definition that said for every y, there has to be there has to exist a unique morphism from y to x. In the case of category generated by partial order p, that means y is smaller than or equal to x. Okay, so that in that case, this that condition is y is less than or equal to x. Of case, x is less than or equal to y, and because x is greater than or equal to y for every y. In the in 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 p, so that means x is the greatest element. And in fact, so I, what I argued is that initial object should be the least element, final object should be the greatest element. And in fact, this element is the initial object, and greatest element is the final object in the category category generated by, from this partial order. So you can view this initial and final object can be as a generalization of the smallest element in the partial order and greatest elements in the partial order. Okay, the remaining five minutes, I will give a definition of the I mean, products and coproducts, and then I will repeat what I tell you in the, in the next lecture, okay? So in the, to talk about products and coproducts, the setting is similar, we have to talk, consider the category and then we have to say, we have to talk, consider three objects, X, Y, and Z. And then we said, so Z is a product of X and Y. If it satisfies some properties. Okay. So 
products of x and y if we satisfy property. And what's the property? The property is, I mean, intuitively, this means that the z acts like a Cartesian products of x and y. Okay. So the condition is there has to exist two morphisms. So one is called pi zero that goes from z to x. So they are like projections from in the Cartesian products. And the other is called pi one, z to y, such that it satisfies the following property. For every uh, object u, and morphisms that goes from u to x and g goes from u to y. So this is for all. There exists a unique morphism K that goes from U to Z such that F and G can be defined in terms of K and the projection. So F is the same as projections K and G same as projection. So I think this definition, if you look at it first, it will confuse it a lot. So I think the better way to, I mean, a typical way that people write this condition is in terms of commutative diagram that I told you. So this story is written like this. It said, we have a object X and object Y in a category. And then we have Z that goes from, and there's a projections pi zero, projection pi one. Okay. And then the condition tells us whenever we pick U and pick F and G, and some notation that I didn't show you, we sometimes write arrow with a dot, dot, dot. This, this means exist. Okay, and then also we put bang there. That means uniquely, that some arrow exists uniquely. So this K, the condition is written like this. So it said we have a pi zero that goes from Z to X, pi one that goes from Z to Y. They are like projections in Cartesian products, such that whenever you pick object U together with some F and G, you can see that this F and G and pi zero, pi one, they look the same shape. It's a bit like a wing. I mean, sometimes this is called span. This is like a wing. But then we feel when, whenever you pick this, uh, something looks like a projection from U to X and U to Y, then this F and G actually can be, I mean, can factorize, I mean, can be explained in terms of, uh, I think I was wrong. Sorry about this, I think I completely messed up. So this condition has to be, um, right. So the definition was right, but just has to be written like this. U, uh, here's F and G. So that's the, what, what's written there. So it means that whenever we have, have U and some morphism F and G, then there exists morphism that goes from U to Z, which is, we, and then it uniquely exists K, such that the left-hand side I mean, this part commutes, also the other part, this part commutes. So commutativity of the yellow part means if you compose with the K, 
followed by pi zero, then that's the same as f. So maybe let's write it here. And so this equation corresponds to the commutativity here. And then the commutativity on the right hand side talk about what's written in the, this case. Yeah. And I I think the best way to actually understand this uh, product, the cool product is depth defined in the dual way. The best way to understand products as well as a cool product that I'm gonna explain later is to solve a similar exercise as the one that I showed you before. So here's an exercise. I mean, okay, so in the category of a set, so what is a product of object X and Y? In other words, two set X and Y, what is going to be a product? And in this, pre-domain and uh, the partially ordered set can ask the same question, what is a product of X and Y, where X and Y are elements in the in the partially in, in the partially ordered set. So I, I mean I will give you an answer now and then I want you to think about this at home. So the product in the top case it's a Cartesian product. Uh, or something isomorphic to the Cartesian products. So that's what happens in the category of set. Products in below case, it's going to be the greatest lower bound. of x and y. So the one below tells us this idea of a product is a generalization of greatest lower bound. OK, so that's it for today. And I hope you enjoy the rest of the week. And I hope to see you all in the next Monday.